Good evening, everybody. I'm Lucy Heller. I'm Chief Executive of ARC, I'm one of the academy groups involved, we hope, in redesigning education. And well, I want to welcome you all today to this, this discussion. Now, we've got quite a lot to get through. There's lots to talk about. Um, and I hope we're going to spark a fierce debate. Um, so I'm going to start, lead straight into the first of our speakers. The plan is that we have two of the speakers, then take a break for some questions and discussion before sort of concluding with a final two. But may I introduce, to start us, Valerie Hannon, who is from the Innovation Unit and will be introducing Redesigning Education. Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to hear about our book. Forced me to introduce it, and the first thing I want to say is that I think it's um, perhaps a rather unusual volume. Though there are multiple authors, this is not an edited set of papers. Uh, this is an act of collective thinking. And it's the act of collective thinking of a, a very unusual community, we think. First of all, it's a global community, um, a group of people who are deeply engaged in policy design and policy implementation in their various countries and jurisdictions from around the world. Uh, but they are people who, in doing that work, often in very public glare of, public, of publicity and uh, focus, are at heart deeply dissatisfied with what they're doing. And they are all part of the global school improvement movement. Uh, but they know that however sharp we are at improving our existing school system, actually it is not going to deliver what we need. Why? Because that system was designed for a quite different age. It's resilient, it's very good at improving, we've learnt a lot about how to do that, but fundamentally it's clamped within a certain set of parameters which were about a different world. And our world has changed so fundamentally. Demographically, socially, economically, it's globalised in ways that even two decades ago we could never have guessed. And its economic foundations are frail, as we know only too well. Across the world, 300 million young people are unemployed. And the economists and the uh, uh, labour statisticians tell us that our schooling systems, our education systems, are not preparing young people with the skills that they need and the employers say they want, or to regenerate our economies in ways that are sustainable and lead to increasing prosperity and good lives. So, the final part to say about our changed world is it has become a digital age. And I'm hoping that this is working for me. Ah, right. That shows a digital age. Those processes, those organisations, hardly even existed two years ago. And yet they now are the kind of age within or the, 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 the nature of our social existence, particularly familiar to young people, but which have hardly changed the schooling system at all. It has not adapted. So the community to which we authors here belong have been thinking about what it might mean to adapt to this world and to the changed social dimensions that I've just gone through very quickly. And we have called ourselves the Global Education Learning Programme, GELP. I'm sorry, I'm clicking this, it's not working, so I'm just hoping something will happen to make it move along. Help from the RSA? Oh well. Thank you very much. Uh, let me proceed, because I know we're so short of time. The Global Education Leaders Programme is the collective author of the book, which I hope you'll take a, a longer look at. Thank you. Um, you'll see from the map that the system leaders who are members of it are distributed across all continents. There are 12 jurisdictions, ranging from high-achieving, highly ambitious jurisdictions such as South Korea and Finland, to emergent economies with high ambitions for their education systems, Brazil, India, as well as all between. Uh, three jurisdictions from North America, uh, from Australia, from New Zealand, and so on. Twelve jurisdictions in all, supported by Innovation Unit and a number, a number of other organisations, and some sponsors which we'll, we'll thank and acknowledge shortly. The Global Education Leaders Programme have come together to work together and to think about how our system needs to change fundamentally, not just improve at the margins, to meet the needs of our young learners. In other words, to equip every learner for success in the 21st century. And for shorthand, we've called that Education 3.0. 1.0 was when we managed access. 2.0 is when we thought about school improvement and got pretty good at it. 3.0 is when we start to move towards a different and, we hope, transformed paradigm. 
So the book represents the knowledge that this community has generated so far. Uh, as innovation units, three authors here, three more authors in the room, but we try to channel the thinking and the work of the organisations, the system leaders, who, by the way, include people who are, might be deputy ministers in their jurisdiction. We have from Finland the Director General of the Finnish Board of Education, from South Korea the Chief Executive of the uh, Korean Education Research Institute, as well as the head of their curricular uh, agency. So, and, and deputy ministers from Vancouver and so forth. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a full list later if you wish, but they occupy, as I've said, very high profile positions. Nonetheless, they have been wanting in a trusting, open and uh, exploratory way to examine what kinds of models exist already in pockets, in bright gems within their jurisdictions and beyond, but also to engage in a process of design as to what that might look like. So the global leaders meet twice a year uh, to think and work together and explore exactly what it is that they've been doing in the interim, but they also work online. So again, there's another slide that will come up shortly. Um, and any of you who are interested in this work, and I do hope you will be, are welcome to join GELP online and look at some of the resources and the tools and the progress that have been made by these jurisdictions. Let, I'm going to finish by just giving you two key ideas which have emerged thus far. The first key idea is that we have learned a great deal from phenomenally successful individual institutions about some of the key design principles that are better adapted to the conditions of the 21st century and really enable young learners to flourish, to engage, to acquire the identity of powerful learners. And there are such examples, but we brought them together almost as a design menu, if you like, for further work. So these design principles are here before you, shortly. <laughs> it's getting boring, isn't it? Uh, and to run briefly through them, they first of all, thank you very much, that would help. They are about collaborative environments where the adults involved have the space and the capacity to co-design the kind of learning that, that goes on. They are not deliverers, they are designers of powerful learning experiences. They are personalised in the sense that we move away from the factory model of batched young people, but or utilise the digital technologies genuinely to engage with the passions and learn ownership and deep engagement of learners, everything that we expect of other kind of services in our environments these days. They are integrated in the sense that they prioritise real-world projects. It's not all about abstraction and what goes on in the classroom. There's a genuine connection with the surrounding community and with people's direct concerns about their own lives and what's going on in those communities. They are connected with their communities by bringing in the resources and the expertise of local communities, whether that's in higher education, whether that's in local business or, or wherever, as well as moving out to utilise different kinds of environments within the community. They are co-created with learners so that peer learning, young people's voice is authentically heard to enable them to be a part of the design process in those learning environments. And finally, and very significantly, they are empowered by the very best learning technologies, whether those are, that's by the system that's put in by a school or young people bringing their own devices and using them in mobile ways. We're just at the foothills, we believe, of liberating the potential of the new technologies to do that really well. So those design principles, I want to stress to you, are not mere abstractions. They are real because they exist in actual schools and learning environments around the world. Problems, often not all together, but identifying their power is the starting point of thinking, what would it be like intentionally to bring them all together in institutions and beyond to characterise complete systems? And finally, we need to think about what it means for a system to enable such institutions to take place. Have we got no? Say, say, say next, next slide. Say next slide. Oh, next slide, next slide. Thank you. There, that would have helped you, wouldn't it? I do apologise. So, going round, those are our six design principles of empowerment, co-creation, connection, integration, 
personalization and collaboration. I'm aware that there's a lot of dense material there. We will give you time to look at that in the book at some length. Next slide, please. If systems want to enable institutions to instantiate these characteristics, we think that we need to reimagine what a system looks like. Right now, we think about it as government, maybe district, local authority, school. That's the system. We believe we need to rethink what a system really is and consider better the image of an ecosystem, something which is more diverse, which is flourishing, which is interdependent, which in a sense is about the sustainability and the release of all kinds of resources which currently in our education systems we do not tap. And in particular, when we think about the jurisdictions we are working with, they are imagining and working in practice with edupreneurs, the creative and cultural sector, higher education, further education in far more integrated ways, business of course, which has a huge amount of untapped potential yet to release, and communities. So we think a, an ecosystem is a far better image to reimagine the resources that we bring to the learning process. And finally, if that's the case, what kind of government role should we imagine that our jurisdictions would take on? Next slide, please. It would be less about direction from on high and specifying curricula and more about creating a kind of platform. I think the kind of platform that Apple iTunes creates for its apps. It doesn't try to create every app. It doesn't suggest what all of them need to be. What it does is create an environment with which tens of thousands of apps can be created by people who want to participate in this space. And that's what we want to see governments going to do around the world. And that is what the jurisdictions involved in the Global Leaders Programme is seeking to do, bit by bit, by stealth in some instances, and in some instances with, with great imagination and energy. Moving from these ideas, we have to think about how, in each of these jurisdictions, the, the beautiful gems become something larger, a system. I'll move now to David. Thank you. Remember uh, to say next slide. I will remember to say next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'm David Albury from the Innovation Unit. Um, and I think the problem that Valerie left us with is a problem that everyone probably in this room will recognise. That is that um, if you go around the world, or indeed go around the UK, you can go to some great schools, some great free schools, some great academies, all of which, many of which, display features of 21st century learning, or even features of 20th century great practice. But one of the great issues that we face is how do we spread those? How do we take the examples of great practice and take them to scale? How do we take them across a system? How do we affect a system where it's not just the lucky few who engage with these sorts of new educational practices, but all students? And this is a challenge that governments, that school districts across the world have faced. And in our journey through GELP, through the Global Education Leaders Programme, we sort of encountered a half a dozen myths about scale and diffusion. Um, I don't want to share all of them, I'll just share three of them with you today. And the first one is sort of illustrated by the slide behind me. The basic method in which governments and school districts, networks have tried to spread great practice is by shouting about it. Well, actually not shouting, but glossy pamphlets, flashy websites, ever bigger exhibitions. And yet all the research and experience around the world shows that pamphlets, websites and exhibitions are of limited effectiveness. And yet we still think the megaphone is the best way in which to do this. The second myth is that what we want to do is perfect our practice and then think about how we take it out to scale. So if we could just create a few more really great schools and then spread out that practice across a country or a district or a city or whatever it may be, then that will work. So we have innovation first and then diffusion. Innovation first and then taking it to scale. Pilots and then rolling them out. Again, the evidence of this is that it is relatively ineffective as a process of scaling and diffusion. And thirdly, and perhaps most contentiously, we believe that the best way to do this is through teachers, that teachers are the best agents of diffusion. 
all three of these methods, you're probably thinking, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's the sort of assumptions that we work with. In fact, we can see through research and experience are all of limited effectiveness. So in this journey of the Global Education Leaders Programme, actually different mechanisms and methods and processes have been developed by people in chains and networks of schools, by system leaders, that are beginning to show more promise in how we can take this forward. Firstly, that the act of developing new practices, of more powerful practices, practices which increase and improve the life and life chances and educational outcomes of students and young people. The ways in which this is best done is not through individual schools doing this, but indeed through creating collaborations between groups of schools. Collaborations between those schools which may be further advanced and those schools which are early adopters. These have many names around the world. Um, in New York City, New York City's Innovation Zone, this is a big community of practice with some 200 schools working together on behalf of the system to generate practices of 21st century education. In New Zealand, they're called networks of schools, again, bringing these schools together. But collaboration between the schools, both those schools at the leading edge and adopters is very uh, uh, important, not let's do the pilots and then roll it out, but how do we involve the others? Secondly, and probably even more uh, seriously for many systems around the world has been we've concentrated on pushing out the ideas and practices. What we're learning through GELT, what we're learning through the real experience of system leaders, of school leaders around the world is that the most important part is about mobilizing the demand. Whenever voice is given to students, we find students demanding changes in educational practices. So that as well as working, of course, through networks of teachers, mobilizing students, mobilizing parents, mobilizing higher education, mobilizing employers to give voice to the dissatisfaction with the present and the encouragement of new models and practices is critically important particularly to those most dissatisfied, most disengaged students, where the disengaged students are, often aren't just those who are underachieving, but indeed a growing community of high-achieving students who are themselves disengaged. And I just, just as an example of where to look for this, British Columbia, one of the jurisdictions involved in GELB, has perhaps done more of this work around how do we mobilise the student voice in a way that generates new practices and increases the diffusion and spread. But finally, what all this adds up to is a very different mindset, not a mindset of government and system leaders orchestrating change, but in a sense, catalyzing social movements, bringing together the parents, the students, the communities, the businesses, the private sector and the public sector in a social movement that advances 21st century education. Next slide, please. But of course, diffuse, diffusion scaling these practices uh, are only some elements of a transformational journey. Um, what we have found both by working with the jurisdictions and Global Education Leaders Programme, but looking at transformation of systems across the world is that there are many elements to a transformational journey. There are many different aspects that have to be considered. Uh, the transformational journey is not easy. I wish there was a nice set of rules that people could just go, we can move from where we are now to where we need to be. But in fact, it's a set of interdependent elements that people need to consider. It's difficult, challenging, and not just complicated, but complex work. And there are many obstacles and barriers many resistances, there are no silver bullets, there are no magical solutions. It requires, as we've learned painfully, I guess, it many times, it requires courage and determination. It requires skill and artfulness. But, next slide, please. It's also the case that what the jurisdictions in the Global Education Leaders Programme have found is that they need roadmaps. We've, we've spent a long time trying to find the right word for this. This isn't about fixed plans. 
These are frameworks within which different districts, different countries, different cities can think about the sequencing of relationships between the different elements. It's interesting to us, we have 12 jurisdictions, we've had contact with many others, that there is no single right pathway that a jurisdiction, a system can follow. The circumstances, the context, the political systems and the history all make different uh, requirements of what the pathway to, to uh, educational transformation might be. But a roadmap, people have found, helps them plot and replot that journey. It's not something fixed, it's something that they learn through, something that helps review progress, that guides the journey, that captures the learning, that enrolls key others. So there's no one right pathway, but we have also learned there are many wrong ones. Uh, there are some false polarities, polarities between subjects and skills, polarities between curriculum and assessment, polarities between standards and structures, all of which may indeed be false polarities in thinking about what the nature of education needs to be in the 21st century. Next slide, please. But I want to return, to just finish before we open it up, to a point that Valerie made right at the beginning. This is not an argument for saying that all the energies of all the people in all systems should be devoted to the transformation that is required to achieve 21st century. There are two sets of challenges. There are two uh, sides, two split screens, if you like, as a metaphor that's been generated within the Global Education Leaders Programme. For leaders of schools, and for leaders of systems, there is a requirement to continually improve the current system, to continually improve the current models and practices. The relentless pursuit of improvement within the current system is necessary, it's vital, but it's not sufficient to address the challenges of the 21st century. So alongside these, uh, the continuous improvement is the need to incubate, to innovate, to employ disciplined innovation methods to develop the models, the practices, and the system conditions that will enable what Valerie referred to as Education 3.0. And we can see in different jurisdictions different ways of doing this. We can see different organizational forms. In Colorado, roughly, there's a, a Department of Education which is majoring on continuous improvement, with one foundation looking at some of the models and practices that need to be developed and another foundation looking at the system conditions. In Rio, in the city of Rio in Brazil, the department itself is split. One half of it is concerned with the continuous improvement of the current system and the other half of the department is concerned with developing the schools of tomorrow. Or in New York City, as I said, the development of an innovation zone acting on behalf of the system. I think it's worth saying, just to open it up and to root it locally, that I think our belief is that the UK is in danger as its competitors and as emerging economies transform their education systems and begin to create learning societies, that in a sense the UK may be becoming a little out of step with these developments. Though Finland, Hong Kong and Singapore are often celebrated for their practices of the past, we need to look carefully at what all three of these jurisdictions are now doing in terms of transforming their education system. So I hope we've said enough to engineer some debate at this point and then we'll move on to other aspects. Of Thank you very much. I think that sets the, sets the scene. Any questions or comments? Um, can you, in order for, to ensure maximum share of voice, can you keep your questions or comments relatively brief and can you also introduce yourself to start? So, gentleman at the back there. Hi, thank you. My name is Nick Fair and I'm a teacher here in Westminster. I, I'm, your presentation and what you're saying, if you don't mind me saying so, it, it seems to be very heavy on um, slogans and um, like education 3.0 and collaboration and also beautiful photographs of turquoise fish and iPads but but it seems to be quite thin on substance and um, what I think constrains me the most 
in the classroom is not what's happening in education, but what's happening beyond education. What my pupils and their parents want are, are, are grades, because they want to go to the top universities, and universities want, want grades. And until that changes, I, I, you know, all of this sounds great, and I suspect none of us disagree with, with, with any of these aims, but I would like you to address the question of practicality here. And okay, how we I'm, can going actually I'm going to take two or three questions first. So I've got this gentleman here who's waiting. Hi, I'll stand up so people can shoot me afterwards. <laughs> uh, name's Jonathan Robbins, uh, fellow, and from International Graded Qualifications, based in Singapore. And I'd like, ah. really, if I may, just to make a couple of very quick observations, which may lead to other questions. Um, partly arising from our last speaker and partly arising from uh, the, the, the last member of the panel to speak. Singapore, often cited, very academically focused. Most people will know about this. Some of you will not be aware that there's been a huge mov movement in Singapore in the last 12 months to what is called by the minister and is thoroughly being driven by the Ministry of Education as a values-driven education. So at the very moment that, it's the, that there is this turn to, to a sort of neo classical neo-vocational curriculum here in the UK. That is actually really being shifted in Singapore. Last observation is this. I learned a very long time ago, and this is the link to grades, that the examination tail wags the curriculum dog. Mm -hmm. If you do not actually sort out what happens about assessment and examinations or whatever else you want to call them, the parents, particularly in Singapore, are not going to change anything. Because what they want is a sufficient number of A-levels, or its equivalent, to get offspring into a university and onto the rung of life or, or whatever. So critically important to this, I will argue, is putting in place new methods of assessing, and I really mean assessing, not just examining, uh, the outputs and the achievements of students. And until that's done in the UK, Singapore, or anywhere else, nothing is going to change. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question here from this lady in the front. Good evening. I'm Susan Trantham, head teacher of Edmonton County School. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was at the National Colleges Conference last week, and uh, the Secretary of State, in, 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 um, in, in, a, in a, maybe a, a slight slip of the tongue, talked about having a floor target of 45 to 50 percent. And uh, I was just thinking about that in the context of what you said. And also, I remember reading Michael Fullan's book about school improvement, where he said that uh, school improvement depends on what teachers do and what teachers, teachers think. It's as simple as complicated as that. So I think we do have the opportunity to have a system, a, a school-driven improvement, because, you know, all the... Na National College and the government and Ofsted are all saying that this is what they want. But I think we do have to root ourselves in the reality that, you know, in some of our schools where, where we, who we would benefit the most from the transformational agenda, which you have, you, which I know you've, you're, you're leading, that 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 they're actually um, might be constrained by the fear that um, they might be taken over and become an academy. and then you yep. come in, David. Right, so to uh, a teacher colleague, I couldn't agree with you more, in a 10-minute spiel in which we're trying to give the high-level concepts, you would be surprised if we were able to do anything <coughs> other than some rather telegraphic <coughs> messages. We hope you'll go to the book, and in the book you will find some absolutely practical examples of the kinds of things that teachers in transforming organisations and transforming systems are finding powerful to enable learners to really engage and succeed. And they include processes and practices such as um, phenomenally interesting project-based learning, which alongside content and subject teaching, alongside emphases on values and character, enable young people to become extraordinarily engaged, uh, obsessed indeed with their own learning. Uh, they include processes such as incorporating internships for work within the learning process, not as work experience, not as an add-on, but something fundamentally integrated within the work. So teacher processes which are fundamental to the transformation. I agree with you, Susan, it's critical 
uh, what teachers do and what teachers think. But if we're following the trajectory of a thought leader, let's follow the trajectory of Michael Fullan and where he is now. He recognises it's not all about teachers anymore, it's about learners too. Because the point is that the digital age has liberated young learners from the closed shop of the school, if you like. Some of them in the future will vote with their feet. They've been doing so for some years in any case, but some of them now see that the opportunities for learning in different kinds of ways, in different settings and different spaces, and in self-directed ways using our powerful technologies will only grow. So teachers are going to be finding a new role within that, we think, a very important role. Our own image that the, the GELT community has, has generated is around teachers as designers of learning experiences. Uh, but they, what they think and what they do is a part of the picture. But as David said, what learners want and what learners can do now is, we believe, very important too. Um, I'll, I'll stop and let you take over the, the more political pieces, because I know you enjoy it. I'm not sure the political pieces, but I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, the point I was trying to make about Singapore was, was precisely the point that you're trying to make, that actually we tend to look at these systems as they were in the past rather than as they are going towards in the future. And I think there is a great danger in doing that because what those high-performing systems have realised is where they got to in the past was not sufficient to enable them to meet to the future. So I totally agree. And I, I agree, and, you know, the one area more than any other, I think, which uh, hinders the uh, efforts of cities, jurisdictions and countries around the world to advance is around the issues of assessment and the issues around metrics. It's not necessarily the same as starting there. When you say there is nothing we can do until this changes, I think there's a lot... There's plenty that we can do, but until we shift that, we won't get the complete sort of transformation. So um, I, I to totally and utterly um, ag agree with that. And it's just a footnote to, to what you said about the 40, uh, 45 to 50%. I don't know, maybe there are people in this audience, I don't know of a great school that I've been to where the, uh, the leaders of those schools and teachers in those schools don't believe that 100% of students can really achieve and that that aspiration is a key aspiration of all these systems that are tr seeking transformation. Indeed, the foundational document of GELP, of Global Education Leaders Programme, was called Equipping Every Learner for the 21st Century. So it's not about a target, a floor target, a minimum of these numbers, it's how do you help but all where, children where achieve. Actually, then, just to follow that up on Susan Parf, sort of where does that leave you in relation to a GO floor target, a specific target like that? What's your What's your response to that? Saying we can all believe that sort of everybody should learn but, and everybody should achieve, but if Gove is coming and saying, fine, we expect this result. Well, I think that as, if, you, if you put that as a flaw, the problem is that people regard it as a threshold over which they could have, whereas the aspiration towards the future, the aspiration of a vision towards education that can really equip all learners with the skills and knowledge that they need is absolutely foundational to making the sorts of progress that we need. But Tony wants Lucy, me, uh, to come in. Tony McKay. Well, uh, only because I wanted to uh, pick up on the point that Susan made here about um, the way in which the discourse is happening. Uh, and being a sort of insider-outsider uh, in this place over many years, um, I think the question in every jurisdiction is how they want to advance their improvement agenda and what metrics they want to use is something that is culturally bound and it's connected to the way in which that system is evolving. I think the split, split screen metaphor that David introduced um, is important to us that in all of the jurisdictions we're working with, they are equally concerned about both, both the improvement agenda and the innovation agenda. And they're finding ways, I think, of being able to redefine how a system is going to emerge to equip all young learners. And I think the question, therefore, just to sharpen the debate in the context of England is to what extent are we really playing out the innovation screen um, in quite the way that I think, quite frankly, we were a decade ago. So well, I'll, just, I'll just stir the pot a little bit here. I'll take Chair's prerogative just to yeah. pose a question to you because I guess my, um, at the risk of being the Luddite uh, in, in the room, I have to say I'm sceptical about some of the talk about 21st century education. I am not convinced that the fundamental business of learning has shifted. It seems to me it's one of the kind of, a conceit of modernity, 
that we think that life is so different in the 21st century than it was. There has always been change. And in the book, you say, you list the TES discussions in 2011 about what's the purpose of education and go on to say, it would have been entirely different 20 years ago. Mm, not really. And I think those people who are in schools would say that a lot of that is actually fundamentally the same and it's about equipping young people with the skills that they need. And in essence, they haven't changed so much. Yes, at the margins, but I just want to sort of push a bit more. And precisely then, when you're talking about the ratios, if you're looking, and I'm obviously connected with working in some of the most difficult and disadvantaged areas in the country, if you're looking there, I have to say school improvement looms much larger in sort of our lives than the radical transformation. And if you're talking simply about resources in an austere climate, Where's that balance? You're talking about equality, a balance between improvement and yeah. innovation. Yeah. Well, I mean, just a, a, a PS on this. Part of the problem, I think, is that um, in order to hear the story, let me just do a, a quick segue as a plug here. Uh, on everybody's table, this is the question about substance um, and practicality, you will find that there is a card that, just so you know now, that has a code for Amazon. and there's an opportunity for you to go to uh, booktrope.com and if you enter the code that's on there, you will receive a copy, electronic copy of the book as a gift. So you can actually have a look to see whether or not the question of substance and practicality is addressed and quite frankly whether the issues around values and the way in which people are tackling the assessment task is there. My uh, comment, I think, uh, Lucy, to your point is that in this country and in many countries, we are seeing the transformation of the learning in our schools. This goes back to Susan's point about who's leading this transformation. In this country, as in many countries, uh, we are seeing schools confronting the challenges that Valerie outlined and ways of operating in, uh, that I think David has outlined that suggest to me that as distinct from some of the discourse that takes place at system level, that is not the reality of the change that's happening on the ground. And so my argument would be that in all of the jurisdictions we're working in and in this place, we are seeing significant changes to the way in which we're going about learning. I'm going to take one final round of questions before we move on to the next set of presentations. Can I have that gentleman at the back there? Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Francis Marietta. I have a long experience in education um, in, develop, in developing countries. And the one issue that I think you're I haven't heard yet is the issue of who makes decisions on what is taught. It's a selection process um, and someone has to make that decision. When you talk about Apple and the apps, I mean not every app is put on iPhone. There's a selection process behind that. In terms of education, you have the delivery of education which is the systems. You have the assessment um, but the ultimate question is who decides on what gets <laughs> taught. There's a question back, back there, saying the lady at the, at the back. Hi, I'm Ruth Kennedy. I'm a disclaimer. I'm a senior associate of the Innovation Unit. I started my career as a teacher. You've only got to follow, uh, um, better, participate in the debates on Twitter involving teachers to realise how polarised, unnecessarily polarised these debates get. And um, in particular, people seeing everything as... Um, opposites that, are, that, are, that, that cancel each other out. And I'd like to hear a little bit more, um, perhaps both from Valerie and David, about the leadership skills and characteristics and indeed the um, features of teachers themselves that are required to make this really work. What I can, I can just imagine some of the people I chat with on Twitter sitting in this room today and thinking, oh, this is throwing knowledge out the window. It, there are lots of schools out there at the moment who are complaining that Ofsted is refusing to, to grade lessons as outstanding if they don't include group work. These fabulous and exciting ideas often fall down in practice because they get codified so poorly and unhelpfully for the practitioners who are at the coalface. And I think, and I'm, well, I'm sure that you know a lot about what needs to be different and better about the people involved that can, can help make these things take root in a really quality way. And then, any questions over here? Uh, lady in red. Oh, sorry, and you will come, you will get your chance. <laughs> um, 
Barbie Building Par, Chief Officer for Woodard Academies Trust. Um, I just really want to pose a plea to the panel because um, the thing that I find most challenging in my role is the stultification of creativity at leadership level. And that stultification is down to what I believe is a tension between the standards and effectiveness unit and the innovation unit, because I don't think they talk to each other. Um, I led a study visit uh, to the United States over the Easter holidays. We did a total immersion program with a fantastic pedagogical approach in Think Forward Institute. We're running our own conference next week in which we have 24 children uh, actually presenting on the impact of that since Easter, and yet the principals are scared to let it go where it can go because of the external constraints that they perceive are there. And I really feel if there's anyone on that panel that can make a difference where it matters at government level, that's my biggest challenge, is create, enabling them to be creative because we want them to be, but they're too scared. And I'm going to take one final question at the risk of LA in front of this lady down in the front. Thanks very much. It was really interesting. Uh, it's Rebecca Phillips from Fluent. Um, I'm a consultant and I've worked a lot in children and young people services, um, increasingly in schools, um, but also in cultural organisations and the vast array of education that they deliver for children and young people. Um, and I was really interested in around the mobilising demand that you talked about, because in all of those different settings I've worked in, I, I work around a system thinking approach. So there's one, there's a problem with language, understanding what that means. Um, but two, they've all got a contribution to make to children and young people's learning, but they're all a bit frustrated. And there's a real sense of powerlessness across each of those different environments. And I'm just wondering about the mobilizing demand. How do you galvanize all that frustration in a way that's tangible and useful and creative and energizing and not uh, as a label for some of them in terms of their mavericks or their dissenters or their troublemakers, how do you actually bring them into the mainstream? Okay, well, you've got a sort of quite a packed <laughs> agenda there to, to cover. I don't know how you want to do it, but Tony, if you want to sort of come in at the end and then you can lead straight into the yeah, concluding okay. slides. Okay. Yeah. So, David, you want to lead off okay, on that let me list just of, say, sort of I mean, I who determines what gets talked? Who, who determines what gets talked? Well, I think that this is an issue about that's being wrestled with in, in, in many jurisdictions. So, um, what, I'm just going to take one to give it just a bit more sense. There's, there's, um, it's a triggered by the fact you say you worked in developing countries. I don't know whether we still call Brazil a developing country, but it's a, a, a strongly emergent... The richest countries one in of the world. One of the richest countries, but nevertheless with uh, huge extremes. Uh, both of wealth and of educational outcomes. And there they're wrestling in Brazil with precisely this issue at different levels in the system. That is, who does decide? Who does really decide? How are we going to form this in the future? So it was a great temptation to go the route because many other countries that are successful have gone for a sort of national curriculum. Let's set this nationally about what should be taught. And they look around the world and they say, well, that's fine, that got people to a certain stage, but actually we know that there is huge energy and passion and huge variation within Brazil. So we need to find a way where we can create a framework within which different states, different municipalities, different schools, different districts can develop curricula that are suited to the purposes and work with those students. They look around the world and they see through GELP or through other networks jurisdictions that don't stand up and say, here's the 25 volume set of what needs to be taught, but those who say, here is a set of competencies or a set of frameworks within which you can devise and develop what is taught for yourself. So this is a live debate. I mean, one of the things that I think is a great danger in these discussions is assuming that we are already in a place that can completely codify what 21st century learning is and how to get there. This is a journey that people are on faced with the very real pressures and challenges that, that they have. There are schools in situations that make disadvantage in Britain look like wealth that around the world are developing models of education to bring those students into the 21st century in a, in a way that gives them a chance to uh, survive and thrive in new circumstances. So it's not about disadvantage and advantage. It's about people finding models that really enable these students to have those skills and dispositions. 
Has it changed fundamentally? This is an argument we can have many times. I don't know whether it's changed really fundamentally, Lucy. What I do know is that the ways in which learning can take place, in which students are empowered and teachers are empowered, look very different in many of these schools around the world than they did 20 years ago. And I think that's what we need to harness and work, about, work out how we create system conditions, the assessment, the, the right level of curriculum specification uh, at different levels in the system. But it's not a finished journey, as we'll come on to in a, in a, in a moment. Do you want to pick up on the questions on sort of creativity and those raised by... I do, and I'll roll it back. into, if I may, the mm. question about the characteristics of leaders who are capable of taking this kind of work forward. And it hinges back again, I think, on issuing false dichotomies. So I think that the kinds of leaders that we're looking at who, who are able to take this work forward, and I think there are some of them in this room, first of all, are absolutely committed to, as you were indicating, Lucy, um, an improvement agenda. It has fundamentally to do with their relationship to evidence, actually so that their, their moral imperative is to utilize the existing evidence on what, create, on what seems to be effective practice for use now. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, it, that? That seems to me to be an absolute imperative of teachers and leaders in our schools. But they know that that's not enough. It's not about throwing all of that out and starting from scratch. It's not that, there's nothing, I mean, the, the work that the Education Endowment Fund is doing is, is fundamental to that task, and that needs to be taken absolutely seriously. What is being said, I think, by the leaders of this jurisdiction is, that is great, but it is not enough. It is not sufficient to address the depths of the, pro of the problems that we face. In particular, our strides at, at uh, addressing the inequities, the inequitable outcomes and opportunities of young people is not there. And secondly, it is not yet leveraging what we have in terms of our digital technologies to take learning to a whole new level. So no false dichotomies, but the leadership characteristics are firstly that they will utilize that evidence, but they will understand that as a system we need to generate new evidence too. So that means an experimentalist approach in some spaces. If you're a system leader, it says, let us invite schools, not require them, invite some schools and environments to innovate on behalf of the system from which we may learn, from which we will generate evidence for others to use. And it's the courage, in a sense, the confidence of being able to say, we're steady on our course, we know we have to do that, there are kids in schools now whose life chances are, are up for grabs, but we need to be thinking about the future and generating new evidence about what might be far more powerful. And I think whether that applies in the classroom or in the, for a, a school leader or for systems, that capacity to hold these things in balance is a very important one. And I wouldn't say it's 50-50 at all in terms of resources, Lucy. If you look at the resources, say, the UK system devotes to uh, what we would call radical transformational innovation, they are minuscule. They are not on the screen. Everything is devoted to improvement. And the jurisdictional leaders we're working with are saying, that's not good enough. If that were to happen in any other field of society, the organization would be dead in the water. You have to be investing in the future and intentionally, systematically, thinking about new processes, new products that fit you to uh, thrive in new conditions. We believe that we have to do that in education, and that's what the global leaders are trying to do. And I'm now going to hand over to Tony, who, in keeping with these new principles of education, I know is going to integrate his response to the question with the remaining presentation. Precisely. You go seamlessly. Um, let me just take us back one step before making clear that uh, this is a work in progress. That's already obvious to you. This is a journey. Uh, we are 12 jurisdictions that have been involved in this work now for some four years. Um, Michael Stevenson, as um, Vice President of Global Education of Cisco, uh, you were our founding partner, and colleagues in this room will know, because it's been mentioned, that in fact uh, one of the early papers that defined the code of 3.0, to go back to the question about what that really means, was spelled out in equipping every learner. And I do think in that exercise, and I won't delay now, we did try and identify the practicalities of what it would take to ensure that we had learning that was relevant for the challenges of this century. I take your point, Lucy, that I can list the learning areas and I can have a sense that none of us in this room, I think, would want to retreat from the importance of that important knowledge, and I could list a set of competencies or capabilities that some people call 21st century skills, beyond literacy, numeracy, ICT, into the area of creativity, problem solving, ethical understanding, cultural understanding and competence, social and emotional, 
the question about to what extent they need to be applied in a more complex and rapidly changing environment is the question for us. How do we equip young people to use that language? We went on, by the way, with a second paper, Michael, and that was the Learning Society, to argue that we can't do this alone. This is not a question just for schools and school leaders. This is actually a society-wide responsibility. And that was part of the reason why we guaranteed that from the start the enterprise was a shared enterprise. So it wasn't just Cisco corporate with Promethean, ICT companies claiming that it will be digitally empowered pedagogy that will deliver the new learning. Uh, we understood that with the help of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with the Alan Koshner Foundation, you need to play in not only the corporates but the not-for-profits, the philanthropists, the social entrepreneurs. All of that is very much part of the conversation that we've had. So I just want to be clear that the work that we've been undertaking has been a partnership across a number of players that people experience within their own school communities, uh, quite apart from obviously the partners that play into a system-wide approach to refreshing the nature of learning. But let me just now make four challenges, okay, um, as we go forward, because we've identified it. So the first slide. You're going to have to go two by one. Yeah. Um, this won't be a surprise. I'm looking at John Bangs. Um, the question about the nature of the profession itself. Quite clearly, if you're talking about uh, multiple players now in the learning game, the question about the nature of the profession, how we think about that, a more differentiated profession, a remodeled workforce. This is language we've been talking about in this country for the last 10 years. And it was one of the first countries to actually shift the balance between those who are perhaps regarded as being the core of the profession and others that support it. But I think in most of the countries that we're working with now, they are thinking very differently about expanding the nature of the educator workforce and the leadership of that workforce. So we could talk more about that. But I do think it is a real challenge for us to think about how that will play itself out in the institutional arrangements of schooling. Next challenge. The more you talk about the way in which you see the learning game opening up from the supply side, and I take it your point about the importance of mobilising the demand side, and often therefore you get the supply response, the more diversity of offering you have. Then when you're seriously concerned about equity, you think seriously about the way in which we are committed in our systems to ensure it's every young person that learns adequately. Then the question, it seems, about new players into the market low-cost providers. I'm just thinking, Simon, about the work of Pearson in developing nations. I'm thinking about Amplify in this country and worldwide, or in Bloom in the US, whatever it might be. There are a whole range of players that are coming into this, and schools and systems will access that in different ways. But the challenge in big cities, not just rural, remote, indigenous communities, the, the challenge in big, complex cities to ensure that there is an attention to equity I think is a big challenge for us as we think about the diversity on the supply side in response to a demand side. Third challenge. Let me go to the fourth. Next slide and I'll come back to this. Because <laughs> I want to finish with the politics. So if you can flick to the next slide. Yeah. The government issue that we've talked about, and then I want to come back to the politics, okay? So it is pretty clear that if you talk about government in the way that Valerie did in terms of platform, the question about government, and there's a whole value proposition around what the public, the public value proposition really is in this space now about learning. But nonetheless, people in all of our jurisdictions are talking more about brokering and enabling than they are talking about providing and regulating. Now, look, that's a simple throwaway line, and obviously systems are very, are, very, are very complex. But nonetheless, it strikes me that we'll have to get much more sophisticated in thinking about exactly what the task and mission is of learning how you operate within the authorising environment of government and how you build organisational capacity with partners to be able to deliver the kind of learning that we're talking about. So it does actually once again bring back into question role of government. This place was one of the first in terms of thinking about it. I just picked up a copy of an old Demos publication uh, by Tom Bentley the other day called uh, Letting Go. And people in this room will remember it. I mean, it's been alive and well for a long time, but it's coming back into sharp relief. And finally, in terms of you know, a work in progress, uh, sorry, go back one. Uh, in other words, go back two. Um, the politics. I mean, I think this is really the game that all of us understand. If you are in the business of serious change, and that's what we are, then the question about how you deal with the culture 
the values, the nature of the political system, how those who are agents of change operate within those environments collaboratively, in partnership, in ways that, regardless of the nature of the authority structure, that really is what we, I think, as educators, need to take on very seriously. So your question about how do we influence, how do we affect the nature of learning so that government is an enabling factor and force rather than an inhibitor is what we see across all 12 jurisdictions. And we are getting better at figuring out how you influence the authorising environment, how you play the nature of the politics of education in each of our respective countries, respecting the value base and the nature of those cultures. But I do think it's through collaboration, through partnerships, through networks, that in all of the systems they are saying this is the way forward. You do it together and not just simply within the sector but across sectors. That's the way in which you actually shift the nature of the learning enterprise. So finally, um, the book and uh, please access through the free download. Great. Thank you, Lucy. And without pausing for breath, because I'm conscious of time and wanting to save more time for conversation, at least in the drinks later, I'm going to hand over, and I can't think of anyone better to make a response to this than Kevin Collins, who is Chief Executive of the Education Endowment Fund, is wrestling with all these problems, having both the benefit of some resource and some cash to look at precisely what works and what is going to change the the system. Kevin. Thank, thanks, Lucy, and <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. I'm afraid that at this end I'm a bit um, education 2.0. On, on, <laughs> on a good day, that is, I have to say. Um, I, I guess I've had the, 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 the privilege and joy of, of, of reading the book, and I know that's sort of slightly different if you haven't had that. And it seems to me always important that, that, that when you read a book has quite a bearing on, on, on your take on it. Um, I guess, I, I guess, I, you know, I, where, where and when, you know, I, I, I love Vikram Seth because I, I read it in India. I, well, not only that, or, you know, I, I, you sit in a pub in Edinburgh and, and, and read about rebels. It's great. I read this book as I was, um, good reason to sit in a pub. I, I read this book as I was uh, on a train hurtling up to, to Leeds to go and visit a school in West Yorkshire. And um, as we were charging up the east of England, all, all was going well as I romped through the first few chapters. And, um, and we, were, we were talking about ecosystems and, you know, the, the, these kind of phrases. I thought this, this is quite a nice way to spend the morning. And then as we were pulling into Leeds, it all started to go a bit wrong because I was starting to ask myself the question, um, now, what, what, what's been practically useful right now as I head towards this tricky school in, 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 in Halifax, I've said it. And um, because I'm going to this school because I'm trying to work out with the school, why is it in a good school where most children do well, uh, only one in four of the children on free school meals are not getting five good GCSEs. And how is this going to help me move, move through that, that story? I decided it wasn't fair to do it on a few chapters. I'd, I'd put that to rest and think about this on, on, on the way back. Interestingly, coming out of the school, many of you will have been in these circumstances before. School improvement, I think, is still a fundamental issue in this country. And I'm talking about this very much from England. I have to say that I'm, I'm a bit narrow in that respect. Um, it isn't rocket science, it wasn't rocket science, and what we needed to do was good, some good old-fashioned school improvement work in, in that school. Um, as I settled on the return leg, um, I was reminded though, and I think this book does this really, really well, is that you do need to manage day by day the practicalities of living and working in the system, if that's where you are, or even in the classroom, as our colleague is, and having space and time to think about these broader, bigger issues. That's really important in our work, whether we're a teacher, head teacher, a parent, or anybody. We have to find that space. Of course, the gold dust is when you find the bridge between the two. That's what we're always hunting down. What are, are, are the bridges that link these, these things together? And I think there are some. The central premise of this book, of course, as you'll know, is that we need to fundamentally rethink what learning should look like. That's a phrase from the book. It seems to me that that phrase has been, has been proclaimed at various times, certainly throughout the 30 years I've been in education, and of course many times before that. Indeed, any reader of education history, which we often don't do and we should do more often, I think, um, will know that the purpose and value of education has been a constant debate. And people have sat in rooms like this and asked this question at different times, going back to, 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 to Lucy's point. In our age, and we are you know, a generation of educators, in, in our age it's pivoted, seems to me, on, this, on, on the challenge of providing an excellent education for all. We haven't delivered that. 
The implications of education in post-industrial age for countries like Britain, we certainly have struggled when you look at the performance in the industrial, post-industrial towns of this country. We haven't worked that out. And the impact of the global economy. Um, and as redefining education sets out, how education is increasingly critical to a successful and happy life and thriving competitive economies. And critically, we haven't mentioned this yet, sustainable communities. We're seeing increasingly in migration in communities like Britain, education is fundamental if you're going to build sustainable communities. It seems to me not, not just important, it's not just that education is increasingly important. Thankfully, and this is my very optimistic take on this, some of the old forces of patronage, of protectionism, of exploitation, some of those forces are waning, which meant if you were just a child of the elite in Britain, basically you were okay. Our country and our economy would serve you well. Although it happens to be in England, if you're a child of the elite, you still seem to do pretty well. Um, but, 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 but that won't last for long, because the competition of the, the world is opening up in all sorts of, I think, democratic and proper ways. So like it or not, and the book gets to this, this is a global, political, and competitive agenda. Interestingly, when you read alongside, education isn't alone. If you get the chance, and after you've done the free download, if you get the chance, there's a brilliant book, you may have already read it, I'm sure you have, by Eric Topple, called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And what Eric does in his book is he explores a similar set of implications from the advance of technology. He talks about the convergence of technology and sets this as the biggest convergence of knowledge, connectivity, and collaboration in the history of humankind, and lays out the implications for medicine, which are profound. It seems to me, and I'm convinced that there, there are great changes happening in the advance of technology, obviously, that, it's not, that, that this won't, it's, it won't be any less surprising this is important for education as it is for medicine. In fact, it could be even more important for, for education. But you have to then begin to ask some of the questions. Learning, the two, the two things I want to quickly touch on are learning, the first one is learning and knowing. Um, I, I want to recall a visit I made to Stanbury Primary School just outside Howarth in Yorkshire. This is now we're in education 0.5. Um, <clears throat> as a naive school inspector about 20 years ago, Stanbury, you need to know, at that time had 23 children in the school. Sits right on the edge of the, of the dales above Howarth. And I went there in my kind of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed way to talk about a, um, a version of the national curriculum. I was met by the head who'd been there, I think, since time, and uh, with, a no with a smile, a knowing nod, and a creak as he opened a cupboard and said, are you talking about this stuff? As these beautifully unopened folders were presented to me. He said, I don't really have much time for any of that. And he said, let's go and see the children. And as we go around, you've got it now, you're going to guess, it was an absolute joy. These were connected classrooms to their communities. They were engaged in what they were doing. They were doing, I'm going to come back to the list later on. I'm going to suggest that these kids in Stanbury were doing all sorts of things that, that we, we talk about in this text quite rightly, picking up on Lucy's point. Mm -hmm. But, and this is the rub, you only had to travel a mile down to Keithley, or where I really based myself in Manningham in Bradford, yeah. to go to many, many classrooms where folksy tales of Dale, Dale's folk, jumps, you know, that drops off the agenda, and what you saw made you weep because we fail to teach so many of the children in that part of this country. It's difficult sometimes, almost, to remember the isolation of schools only a few decades ago. And I guess one of the interesting points for me quite right now is that the return to isolation and ignorance is a risk of autonomy and independence. But, you know, I'm sure we're all managing to mitigate that. Improvement now and then demanded that we learn how to look out and learn with each other. Not from each other, I don't think, but with each other, which is quite a different take on it. Redesigning education, the book, Redesigning Education, is a self attestment to the power and possibilities of connection. I really like the way the book sets out the case for learning ecosystems and the complexity of leadership relationships, providers, connecting infrastructures, and the market. Although it's interesting for me that as we've learned education is more powerful economically, isn't it a surprise that people who previously didn't invest in it, are all charging forward to want to support us and help our children learn. Education is a competitive market where people want to own the commodity of knowing and knowledge. And we need to think about that as the leaders and guardians of children. Visiting uh, Babul Ulam Public School in East Delhi last year, the contrast from Stanbury Primary couldn't be greater. I was with teachers using the internet cafe nearby to search for new resources, picking up on lessons teachers had written that are now loaded on the TES teacher's website of 600,000 lessons. A young teacher was using her mobile phone in order to capture better pronunciation for phonics lessons she was teaching to these young children. These were teachers who were 
and then sharing their lessons, joining a charity to share their innovations with other teachers in India's 1.4 million schools. So teachers are behaving in all sorts of new ways, and I think that, we, that the book's beginning, as, 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 as Rezani Education rightly illustrates, learning ecosystems with new players and new partners at the teacher level as well as the institutional level. But collaboration has to be for a purpose. The book sets out five priorities for Education 3.0, Environments that, are per, you know, environments that are personal, connected, co-created, collaborative and empowered. I actually don't think Stanbury would argue and indeed would probably do pretty well on that test. And this is my question at this point. Notwithstanding the changes in technology and the open learning platforms that bring teachers from the world into our classrooms, have the learning priorities for children really changed? And I need someone to set those out for me in a compelling way. Have they really changed? Education systems, my second theme finishing for better learning. Redesigning education sets out the essential skills of problem solving, decision making, creative and critical thinking, the list, you'll know. The list has got to be broadly right set out in the book and I don't want to argue one list against another, that seems to me arid and facile. But here's the rub. Much of this that we're trying to promote in these new kind of um, ways of learning rather than the actual learning, the ways of learning, ways of interacting, uh, we want to see in children aren't instead of what we were teaching. They're as well as we were teaching. It's more that children have to need to, need to know. We, know. we need teachers to teach better. Not only do, we, do more children need to learn, the impact of failure is more profound. There are no mills at the end of the, the you know, there are no mills at the end of the valley in Haworth anymore. If you fail in school, it's going to be obviously an enormous struggle. So education exclusion is the great social challenge and the great educational challenge of our age. How can we ensure that we don't give more to those who have and further exclude those who have not. For me, you know, the gospel according to Matthew ought to be the living motto of education and guides us in our thinking. Education inequality, and someone mentioned Brazil, we could talk about a number of the countries, but we could certainly talk about here. Education inequality and the implications for social mobility are the biggest issue that faces our generation of teachers. I read every education book through that lens, and we need to be sure that the changes will improve the attainment of the economically disadvantaged and socially excluded. Change needs to happen differently. It needs to be informed by applying rigorous evaluation and research. Disciplined innovation, to our colleague's point about creativity in schools. Disciplined creativity, disciplined innovation, where we have the evidence that what we're doing makes the difference, actually delivers on improving outcomes, particularly for disadvantaged children. It's great to bring global leaders together. That is absolutely a wonderful idea, but bringing the right people together alone isn't enough. It's the right people doing the right thing that really matters. It's not about who designs change, it's about the methods and evidence used to shape the ideas. I would like to see the ideas and proposals contained in redesigning education tested and in, as, as, as Valerie said, as the Education Endowment Foundation, it's great that we're involved in testing some of these approaches together in rigorous controlled trials. The GELP approach is refreshing. It's great to bring and all too rare to gather leaders, authentic leaders from across the globe to consider questions. This must be a good place to start. Um, and I really like the idea of split-screen vision. This is helping me understand my ageing as, as I go. You know, I'm all over the place. But it's a well-made observation of the challenges leadership. It's always tempting for leaders uh, to suggest, like everything else, it was harder in our day. I do, however, think that those with experience in leadership now need to concede. It's never been harder, and yet with more possibility and potential. This is because both what's needed and possible, another phrase from the book, is charged with the power and challenge of technology. While I applaud this approach and found insights from the gathering of leaders particularly interesting, I'm left wondering, isn't that in itself a bit old school? Doesn't the, and won't, won't this feel a bit old school? I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Doesn't the change we're considering now bring a broader set of players to the, to the table? Where are the teachers themselves? Where are the parents? Where are the children? These are the players who are going to determine the education of the future. Teach me, parents setting up free schools. This is what's happening, and we need to stay with that pace. I'll leave with three questions. What is the new learning we're attempting to build? What stops us being the schools we want to be already? And what is the evidence that these approaches suggested will actually better for all children?
Thank you. So this is a properly tantalising note to end on, because I think that leaves us with questions which some of you long to answer. I know the panel is certainly longing to respond to. But before we depart down to have drinks, and I hope you will join us downstairs, we have appropriately a word from one of our sponsors. I'm going to hand over to Michael Stevenson, uh, ex of Cisco, who was there at the beginning and have been an important part of this process. Thank you, Michael. Lisa. I think I just want to say on behalf of um, not just Cisco, but the Gates Foundation and Promethean and Cochland in Australia, uh, what a privilege it's been to uh, initiate and help steer the GELP program these last five years or so. Um, I think the work is significant. This is whole system transformation and not whole system transformation in the name of bumping up the scores by 2% a year, but whole system transformation uh, hopefully to take many, many learners to the vista of higher order capabilities and beyond to new paradigms of, of uh, pedagogy and remarkable capabilities. Um, I've picked up from this conversation this evening that GELP needs to stay practical, to stay rooted in the real world, um, even the fearfully real world of the United Kingdom. Um, and I would assure you that um, in much of the road mapping work, uh, there is grim realism. Um, that assessment is a driver of change. Um, uh, that um, uh, in the end, uh, unless you mobilize a broad support platform, you will be um, uh, seen off uh, uh, by those who would want to choke innovation. Uh, so I think much of that has come through in the best road maps from the best countries. Um, I would simply want to end, I think, with, um, with two challenges to the Global Education Leaders Programme, if I may, in its next manifestation, uh, well beyond me. Uh, one would be to move from strategy to action. Um, we see 3.0 schools, if you'll forgive uh, the phrase, uh, in a number of developing and developed countries, Australia, uh, Canada, uh, the UK, the US, but not really yet. 3.0 systems, and it is systems that deliver the equity. Um, uh, and in emerging countries, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Turkey, uh, Korea doesn't really count as emerging, one has recently seen the collapse of very well planned um, and significant system changes, largely for want of political capability. Um, so I do very much hope that we can think through how to get strategy into action. A final thought. Um, is just that perhaps we see some in the commercial sector finally coming through, not simply throwing technology at hard problems, but bringing together in a very dynamic relationship strong curriculum content, great pedagogy, real-time data, though not yet adaptive learning systems, and consultancy so that teachers can figure out how to do this stuff. And it would be terrific to feel that there are a small clutch uh, of potentially global players who can finally underpin this kind of system transformation that we've all wanted for so long. Thank you very much for letting me offer last thoughts, but time for crisps and drinks. And with, with thanks to all our panel, I know you've joined me in thanking them very much. Thank you.